And I think Senator Trotilla's bill was designed to stop that. It was not. It was not designed to stop the governor from asking the people of Montana to thank farmers and ranchers. It just wasn't, and it can't be construed that way. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Molloy. I have just one question. Yes. I, too, uh, would have liked, we had earlier conversations, uh, you, Republican Councilman, and myself on the telephone, about looking for this legislative history that will tell us what the state legislature intended. And uh, I was hoping that we would find some enlightenment in that legislative history to direct us as to exactly what the legislature intended. And I, I agree with you, um, that doesn't seem to be there. So that's, I guess, in part why we're here today, and that's why legal disputes arise, is sometimes the legislature isn't as clear as it can be or doesn't think of a particular instance, and that's why we're here. So um, I, we all wish that uh, there was more clarity. If so, we wouldn't be here. Now, my question, though, is, I'm intrigued by the Surgeon General coming to Montana. It seems like uh, you've cited a, a particular common situation. Surgeon General uh, is concerned about public health. In this instance, he's concerned about uh, teen drinking, could be drug use, could be any number of issues. So it's my understanding at least that if the governor makes a public appearance with the attorney general and says, gee, the attorney general and I want to encourage the teens of Montana not to do something because of the health risks, that would be perfectly lawful. Is that, am I correct? I, I, I don't have the breadth of imagination that counsel for Republicans have, but I can't imagine how he could stretch the statute to call that unethical. Oh, I agree with you. Yeah, so I, I mean, I'm just trying to figure out just how far of a reach we go here. So, but the question we are presented with in this case is if the governor pre-records a message to be distributed by the media saying the Surgeon General is going to come and I am going to work with the Attorney General on this issue and that that is distributed to the media and is produced by the media, that's pretty much the situation that gives rise to this complaint. That is exactly the situation that gives rise to this complaint and because of the pendency of this complaint and because of the, um, the, the ambiguity of the statute, I mean, obviously we're disagreeing about what the statute prohibits, we said, no, we're not going to engage right. Yeah. But, 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 but as a matter of fact, um, it's my belief that you should construe this statute using the general rules of statutory construction to, um, to find that that kind of a public service announcement is, does not constitute the use of public funds within the meaning of the statute. Right. Well, I certainly, uh, I, I appreciate your, your statement here this morning. Um, because this, this is a confusing issue. I, I wish it weren't a confusing issue, uh, but, uh, but it is uh, confusing as to exactly what the legislature had in mind when they wrote this uh, particular statute. Thank you, Mr. Malloy. You'll be uh, given uh, approximately 15 minutes in terms of rebuttal.
addressing those comments. This case is a pretty black and white case about the rule of law. And the bottom line is, the rule of law applies to everybody in Montana, including the chief executive officer. No one is above the law. Your Honor, as you know, the statute that issued here plainly and simply states that a candidate may not use or permit the use of state funds for any advertisement or public service announcement in the newspaper, on radio, or on television that contains the candidate's name, picture, or voice, except in the case of a state or national emergency, and then only if the announcement is reasonably necessary to the candidate's official functions. I've cited in the brief the history of the mandatory rule of construction. It is set forth not only in the original and current statutes of the state of Montana, it is announced not only by the Montana Supreme Court, but it is also announced by the U.S. Supreme Court, and I cited cases tracing it to biblical times, and also William Blackstone, and also Alexander Hamilton. Now, if the rule that an adjudicatory body such as this is to apply the plain and ordinary language of a statute, and give effect to the plain and ordinary meaning of the words, is good enough for Moses, good enough for Blackstone, good enough for Hamilton, it's good enough for me. And I urge you to follow that rule, and also I refer you to the portions in our brief in which we point out that rules of statutory construction are not binding. The implicit exclusion rule expressly has been held not binding on a court, and moreover, both the U.S. Supreme Court and the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals have cautioned to put the statute in its proper context before you invoke such a rule, because after all, you are being asked to infer an implicit exclusion where I think, in this case, the legislative history clearly demonstrates that none was either expressed or implied by the legislature. Let me talk a minute about the story that the legislative history tells here. The overarching purpose of this bill, which controls, and again, Professor, with all due respect to your conclusion that it's ambiguous and unclear and so on, the legislative intent must be given effect, if at all possible, and it controls here any determination. That has to be the primary rule of law, or laws mean nothing. If the governor thinks that an exception should be read in, laws would be meaningless. Frankly, I don't know any jaywalker who, once caught, says, well, they didn't mention this street, they can't possibly mean me. That's exactly what this case is about. 